So um, firstly, we would just want to um, define research data management in the regulations. We defined it as uh, planning for the way in which research data will be managed during and after the research process and controlling the collection, processing, analysis, sharing, dissemination, curation, and reuse of the research data. It's important to note here that it's during and after the research process that needs to um, be considered. Uh, research data management is a core principle of good research practice, scientific integrity, and we know that there are lots of legislation and requirements that go along with that. So why do we need um, regulations around research data management? Firstly, it's to enable compliance. Um, there's lots of national and international legislation. We think about POPIA and the European Union GDPR. That's very important for um, protecting personal information. So there are legal obligations. There's lots of ethical responsibilities. Of course, if we work with um, research subjects or research participants, personal information, um, and then we go over to integrity and uh, scientific validity as well. Um, and that all is important for research data management and how we manage that. Then contractual requirements, of course, some funders will have specific requirements and the researchers must make sure that they know exactly what these requirements are. Um, we've got IP, um, data sharing, data retention, et cetera, that can um, be included in a contract, and the researchers must make sure that they um, take note of those. And then we have our own institutional policies and regulations as well that we have to comply with. Um, and in some cases, non-compliance can have severe financial repercussions and then, of course, cause reputational damage for the university. So we want to make sure that we do things right. The regulations also provide a foundation to define the principles of the governance at the university and including the protection of research participants, which is important for this um, audience today. Uh, we provide the framework to define the responsibilities of everybody at the university in the process. And we want to guide researchers and students in the best practices of RDM. Um, and that is why we are working together as several um, support divisions to actually do this. Uh, the research data management regulations were approved by Senate in November 2020, and we are in the process of reviewing and editing that. So the new version will um, actually appear or we have to go into for uh, um, the cycle of approval later in the year. Um, the research data management regulations are also part of the research governance framework of the university. And in the regulations, we refer to other policies and um, regulations that people must take note of. So when we um, talk about the research data life cycle um, as the model that describes the steps to be taken in the different um, stages of research, we always start with data management planning. Um, that is where the data management plan comes in and uh, all research projects at the university must have a research uh, management plan, a data management plan now. Uh, we're going to go into data collection in the next step. We're going to process and analyze the data in the third step and then uh, it will be published um, and, or shared in some way. And then the data can be reused. And throughout the life cycle, data curation takes place, uh, which involves the maintaining, preserving and adding value to the research during the life cycle. So in section 15 of the regulations, the roles and the responsibilities of researchers and research support divisions are packed out in the regulations so that there's no doubt what people are responsible for. Um, the range of skills and knowledge that are needed to deliver the services is dictated by the phases of the life cycle. Um, firstly, it will be important to note that because Stellenbosch University is a legal entity and the legal entity, um, it will be the legal owner of research data, but it's not um, practical to actually let the university manage all the project data. So the um, when a principal investigator starts a project, um, that person is automatically assigned as the data steward and will take responsibility for the research data management of the project. Um, and then another important thing is to note that core, the core ethical principles apply to all types of research, not just research um, including human participants. So all research um, uh, will 
be involved in that as well. You have to have to take note. So when we start our project planning, we're going to uh, plan the work plan. We're going to use the scientific method or whatever uh, the project plan will look like. And we're going to do good um, project management. We're going to um, consider good scientific practice and scientific integrity. And then in that um, instance, we're, while we're planning the project, we're also going to look at national, international policies and regulations that may be relevant for the project. Uh, in the end, you will have a project work plan, you will have a risk assessment plan, and then you will also have a data management plan. And all the costs that go along with these three activities will be included in the project budget. So it's very important to do the research data planning from the start so that you can include the different costs into your um, budget that will go into your funding proposal. So if you are uh, working on your data management plan, um, I've noted here the, the, the different support divisions that can assist researchers in the different steps. So library and information services can help with the data management planning, uh, metadata standards, uh, long term archiving of the data, etc. And then uh, the questions around um, licensing or um, intellectual property or ownership of the data will be covered by the Division for Research Development Contract Office. They can help researchers with that. Um, the IT can help with uh, infrastructure, hardware, software, uh, different data storage requirements, and they also have a cost calculator to help researchers with um, determining the cost of different activities, and they can also assist with data security and big data management. If personal information is going to be collected uh, or processed or reused, Information governance will help um, researchers to do the privacy impact assessment to determine the value and risks um, associated with the data that you will collect or work with. And IT will help you to de-identify or encrypt your files uh, because that might be necessary or required for your project if you work with personal information. You also have to apply for ethics approval and uh, the that process takes place within the DRD and they will help you to um, set up informed consent forms as well from um, for your research participants. So um, if you are going to do a funding proposal and the funding proposal is successful, most funders nowadays require a due diligence questionnaire to be filled out um, and the DRD also assist researchers with that process. And then you can also um, contact them to um, make sure that you, if you need a data transfer agreement, if your data will be transferred or shared between parties. So lots of people that can assist researchers in the planning stage already. The head of department will be responsible for the governance and oversight of the research data management in the departments and then compliance with the regulations. So all the other um, activities here will be the responsibility of the principal investigator then with support from the divisions that I just spoke about. So if we move along um, and we're going to execute the work plan now according to the plan, the project plan, then we are going to collect data. The principal investigator is responsible for that as well. And in the end, you'll have active data captured and metadata for, for, um, for the data sets that you have. IT can assist researchers um, to choose the correct software for active data storage, and they will advise on the best solutions to use there. Um, and then library and information services can help with metadata standards, controlled vocabularies, et cetera. And of course, then uh, backupping and uh, protocol databases, et cetera. Um, in the third step um, of the cycle, we're going to do data processing and analysis. And this will also be done by the principal investigator or the students who ever work in the project. And in the end, you will have processed data and data that will be prepared for research output or publication. Um, library information services has a wealth of information um, and some lib guides that can help um, researchers to do the visualization and uh, prepare the data for publication.
then when we're in the fourth phase, we're going to start sharing or publishing the data. And important things to remember here again is the data transfer agreement that might be required. Um, we have to make sure that the researchers have an ORCID record and that the data publications will also be included in that and that the citation is done correctly. And then every publication must have a unique DOI so that they can actually be cited as well. So there are different options to publish the data. Firstly, um, the university has its own uh, data repository called Sun Scholar Data Repository. Library Information Services manages this repository and they also have a guideline document for researchers. Um, and you can also contact um, Samuel Samango who will speak after me about um, depositing your data into the repository. But data can also be published as supplementary data to a journal article, but that can also be linked to the Sun Scholar data repository. You can publish your data article in a data journal or in a third party digital data repository. And all of these can be also be linked to the Sun Scholar data. If you want to reuse data, it will be very important to know that the research data management cycle begins again here, and you may need to get some research ethics um, committee approval again um, if you want to reuse specific data. So make sure um, which um, data, if, what data you're going to use and if you need that. And then, of course, um, that you use the citation if you use somebody else's um, data, research data. So digital curation is the value added activities and features to make the content more meaningful and useful. Um, and these things take place throughout the data lifecycle and library information services can help researchers with that. So apart from the policies and the regulations that we have in the research data governance framework of the university, we also have specific platforms and tools to assist researchers. I'm just going to mention a few. Um, the Research Data Lib Guide that um, Samuel developed is, is a wonderful source of uh, information about research data management, and um, you can check, you can actually follow the link to go there. The Sun Scholar Data and the Lib Guide um, around the Sun Scholar Data is also very um, for researchers that want to publish there or deposit their um, research data there. Uh, the, uh, Samuel was a part of a consortium that developed a research data management adventure game that people can play it and it's like an interactive game where data management challenges are done and then they can learn more about um, research data management. Then we have a um, research ICT service desk that um, where uh, researchers can actually post their um, inquiries or um, questions. And this goes through to the research data management advisory team that are from different um, support divisions uh, to help researchers to actually do the research data management correctly. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. So over to you, Samuel. Uh, thank you very much, Sarita. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Just give me a second. And I have confirmation if you can see what's on my screen now. We can see it, Samuel. All right, great. So I'm going to continue from where um, Sarita left off, um, but I will cover some of the things that she, uh, or at least um, broad issues that she covered. Um, I'll start off with the external funder requirements because these, these are some of the things that researchers actually need to take into consideration when they start with their research projects. It's important to note that external funders have their own requirements and sometimes these may actually clash a bit with the university's own requirements. Where there is such a class, you should note that the external funder requirements will actually take priority and will uh, supersede the university's requirements. Now, this actually then has some bearing on or influence on your um, data management plans because some funder, uh, funders actually require that researchers have their own data management plans. So the RDM regulations take this into consideration and it's acknowledged that where a funder actually has their own template and they want you to create a DMP using their own template, then researchers should go about and use such a template. Otherwise, researchers should actually defer to an institutional template. Now, this is what the was stated in the regulations, but I should point, be pointing out that at the moment, this has actually not been operationalized yet. So the university does not actually have its own the DMP template that can actually be accessed. 
primarily because there actually isn't any institutional data management planning software that's already in place. So this is something that is still um, in the pipeline. So for the time being, researchers are actually then um, directed to third party data management planning tools. Now, one thing that um, I should um, reiterate though is that um, I just want to check something. One thing that I should reiterate is that um, it, the regulations stipulate that researchers should actually um, review their data management plans at least uh, twice a year. And it's important that if you do need some kind of assistance with that, you can certainly contact the library for um, a bit more assistance with regards to setting up your data management plans. Now, if you take into consideration things such as data acquisition and um, management of your research data, what the RDM regulations state is that um, researchers should try to actually make use of storage media which are actually supported by the university, primarily if they're supported by the university's IT division or the library. And you can certainly see um, some examples of, uh, of these tools um, on the screen right now such as Sun Scholar Data, Microsoft OneDrive for Business, and Microsoft Teams. It's important that you actually make use of Stellenbosch University's version of Microsoft OneDrive, as well as Microsoft Teams. Now, when you're actually trying to share your resource data, it's important that researchers um, actually make use of data transfer agreements. And this is especially important when you're dealing with sensitive data. For further um, assistance with regards to um, completing data transfer agreements, researchers can actually contact the DRD's Research Contracts Office. Now, when considering the management of research data, it's important to consider that the fact that we try to promote making research data open and accessible after research projects have actually uh, been completed. But that being stated, the university understands that such research data should be made um, as open and accessible as possible, but as close as necessary, because there are certain circumstances under which research data cannot actually be made open and accessible due to their sensitive nature. This could be due to resource contract restrictions, intellectual property restrictions, as well as data privacy restrictions. But there are certain degrees of um, openness that are actually permissible. So either uh, the research data can actually be placed, let's say, under embargo by way of example, but the metadata associated with such research data could be made openly accessible by the university's um, institutional research data repository, some scholar data. Now, Another issue that is um, addressed by the regulations is the ethical considerations that researchers must take into account. Sarita covered this um, to a certain degree as well. What I wanted to point out is that in this sense, the RDM regulations do not try to replace what you would actually find in um, most of the SOPs um, associated with the university's research ethics committees and any other um, associated uh, policies. These certainly still do apply, but the RDM regulations try to plug in the gaps that did not address specific issues pertaining to research data management. So researchers will still go through the, um, the university's research ethics committees um, for ethics applications. But one thing that should be pointed out is that if you are actually, um, actually um, working with sensitive research data and you're actually collecting your research data from human participants, then under such circumstances, what the regulations will state is that researchers should also make use of uh, the university's privacy impact self-assessment tool. We generally refer to that as a PISA. It's actually managed by the university's division for information governance, and it ge generates reports that actually assign risk ratings to the research data. So it actually informs a researcher as to whether or not the research data are medium risk, low risk, or high risk in nature. Now, in addition to primary um, research, researchers can actually collect secondary um, research data that actually may be sensitive in nature. If that is the case, what the regulations state is that researchers should actually make use of a data transfer agreement. And once again, for further assistance on how to actually um, complete such a DTA, researchers can contact the research contracts at the university's DRD. That's the Division for Research Development. 
Now, the last thing that I want to point out is that the regulations actually, um, I think I'm going to skip in slides. The regulations address the legal requirements um, as well, and this is the final thing that I'll actually cover. The university's RGM regulations do not really unpack the legal requirements in great detail simply because the actual laws do actually exist in the um, country's um, legislation as well as some existing case law. But I'll just unpack this um, very briefly. The actual relevant laws that apply in this regard are intellectual property laws, such as copyright, patents, trade secrets, and licenses. Generally speaking, if you're dealing with any of these issues, you can actually um, approach the university's um, resource contracts office at the DRD prior to commencing with your um, research project. Secondly, there's the issue of data privacy, which is extremely important, especially in the light of the promulgation of um, relevant provisions of the Protection of Personal Information Act, the PAPAYA, but other relevant um, legislations would be such as things such as the National Health Act, as well as the European GDPR. Thirdly, so the issue of access to information. So there are certain circumstances under which uh, people can actually gain access to um, data that are actually not um, in the public domain, so to speak. And this is in terms of the promotion of Access to Information Act. In such cases, researchers can approach the university's um, Information Governance Division for um, assistance if you actually do get a request to actually um, provide access to um, data that are actually um, privately held. The next thing to take into consideration deals with uh, research contracts. Now, this is not something that is completely new. Um, the university's DRD had actually been addressing this issue via the research contracts office for several years before the RDM regulations were eventually um, approved by the university senate uh, in 2020. And if you actually have a look at the DRD's website, you'll see that there's a broad range of different types of research contracts that they actually um, do help researchers out with. So if you are actually working on your research project, especially if you're commencing and you need some kind of assistance with regards to your research contracts, you can certainly approach the DRD's research contracts office for assistance with that matter. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I will now hand over to Hilda to take on the next leg of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Hello, colleagues. I'm going to share my screen with you quickly. OK, um, let me just see if I'm not on mute. I'm not. My name is Yoda. I'm a member of the research IT team. We are a team of three people. My two colleagues are Millie and Peter. You might know Millie from the Red Cap at Sun um, support team. So Sarita and Samuel mentioned that researchers in their capacity as research data custodians or stewards have quite a large number of responsibilities. Um, What we realize, though, is that unless researchers have the tools they need to do these things expected of them, um, there's a slight chance that they will actually be able to, to meet those requirements and responsibilities. So what we are working towards is what we call the Stellenbosch University Research ICT Commons. And the Commons is a collection of services, of infrastructure, of applications that will meet the requirements of the bulk of our researchers, the majority of our researchers. So we don't have the capacity to meet the highly specialized needs of every single researcher or research group, but at least with the Commons, we, we aim to meet the, the majority of requirements. In addition, the aim is that those um, components in the Commons should be available at no cost to our researchers. In some cases, there will be fair use principles applied, 
Um, just so that we don't end up with the tragedy of the commons where um, everybody just grabs as much as possible and then there's nothing left in the end. Okay, so to give some examples of the tools that are in the um, in the commons um, and in the ICT toolbox, I've highlighted a few here. You'll, you'll see I, I split it into what we call institutional solutions and then specialisms or research group or researcher specific solutions. Um, and again, what we are doing is we're mapping the tools that we are making available, the tools and the services um, against the research data management life cycle just to make sure that for each phase of the life cycle, there are tools available in, in the commons. And later on, I will highlight a few of, of these tools. Um, just to mention some of them, we have institutional licenses for a number of software packages, such as Atlas TI and MATLAB, and those you can find in our institutional software hub. Um, the Microsoft 3, 365 stack, so things like Microsoft Teams, um, SharePoint libraries, Microsoft OneDrive, uh, those definitely meet the requirements in terms of storage and collaboration uh, of a large number of Stellenbosch University researchers. And then for people working with, for researchers working with sensitive personal information in the data collection phase, we implemented an institutional instance of, of the REDCap data collection tool, and we really firmed up the security controls around REDCap uh, to make our data as, as safe as possible. As Samuel mentioned, a number of tools are in the pipeline. So the data management planning solution, and then what we're working on at the moment is something called Symplectic Elements, which supports the, um, the capturing of data for research outputs for submission to the DHET for subsidy purposes. So we work not only on tools for researchers doing their research, but also to enable the administration around research, the ethics clearance process, reporting to the DHET, all of that, those administrative research related tools. We um, try to find tools that are as intuitive and fit for purpose as possible so that the researchers can spend more time on actual research and less on admin. Then why we would like our researchers as much as possible to use the tools that are in the institutional commons is because we know what the security controls are that are in place for these tools. So more and more we see research collaborators or funders or research contracts partners giving research groups security checklists. Um, sometimes they call them third party risk assessments. Um, and researchers have to explain exactly from a technical perspective, how are they securing their data? And if the tools are in the institutional commons, we will know exactly what controls were implemented. And it's easy for us, relatively easy for us, to collaborate with our researchers to complete these checklists that they receive. Um, in the instance of something like REDCap, for example, if research collaborators want to know how is your research instance secured, then we can give them a paragraph or two that sets out exactly what the security controls are that are in place. Um, and it makes it much easier to get those um, checklists approved. Then, as Sarita and Samuel mentioned, a good place to start is with the privacy impact 
impact self-assessment because once we know what the sensitivity of our data are, is it minimal risk, low risk, medium or high risk, we can choose the appropriate tools. Um, so in some cases, it will be fine to use Microsoft Forms and not REDCap, the institutional um, version of Microsoft Forms, I should say, if you are working with minimal risk data. So this is really a good place to start. Know what the sensitivity of your data set is and then choose the appropriate tools where possible from the institutional commons. OK, we mentioned Microsoft 365. Um, quite a bit of storage space behind both the institutional um, OneDrive accounts and Microsoft Teams, and then the SharePoint libraries underpinning every Microsoft Teams site. An easy way to see what are these things that are in the Microsoft 365 stack is to go to portal.office.com. Um, it's the, the shortest URL I remember to get to the Microsoft site. And then to log in with your work or school account and not your personal account. This distinction is quite important because if you choose your work or school account and you log in with your Stellenbosch University username and password, you get to that part of the Microsoft Cloud that Stellenbosch University manages by virtue of the educational agreement we have with Microsoft. So not the free Microsoft space you get when you create a personal account, but your space you get that's linked to your institutional Stellenbosch University identity. Then, as I mentioned, the institutional instance of REDCap, where we really pulled out all of the stops to put in the necessary security mechanisms to make it as secure as possible. The software hub I mentioned, where you can get access to those software packages that the university has an institutional license for. Then for those of you um, who work with things like R and Python, for example, Dr. Kim Martin established a research software engineering group at Stellenbosch University, and you're more than welcome to reach out to her if you need advice around research software engineering. What Sarita mentioned is I mentioned a lot of things now. Samuel and Sarita mentioned a lot of things. If you feel lost and you just have a requirement, I need to transfer a fairly large data set or I have a SQL database that I need to store somewhere secure, a good first port of call is the Research ICT Service Desk. Log your request here and we will rope in the necessary specialists to get you an answer to your questions um, and help you meet your requirement. Again, you'll see the service desk is organized according to the phases of the uh, research data management life cycle. And then what my colleague Millie is also in um, developing, but it is already available, we just enhance it as we go along, is this online version of the toolbox. So here you will see all of the things I mentioned in the presentation and then some. So if you are looking for tools related to a specific phase in the research life cycle, like data collection, this is a good place to go to see what we have available at this point in time. And I think from my side, that is all. So thank you very much for your time. The presentation is available online, so you can access it there. Uh, and I think we have time for questions now.
Thanks, Hilda. I, I see there we already have some questions. Um, Dr. Melindy asked, um, how is Stellenbosch University's legal ownership of research data determined um, in context of SU researcher collaborating with researchers from other institutions? So uh, in um, the section 8.2 of the research data management regulations, it actually says that the research data belong to the university unless there are specific terms regarding intellectual property rights in the funding agreement. So in this case, it will be very important to uh, that the researcher knows what exactly is the stipulation in the research agreement or the contract. Um, because the university is the legal owner of the research data that is collected at the university or by the university researchers, and will obviously then also be accountable for the integrity of the data, even after the researchers have left the university, that we need to know what happens with the, with the data that is collected. So uh, we have that responsibility. So um, you have to find out what are the stipulations in your research contract, in your collaboration agreement in this case, and to make sure if there are any intellectual property uh, rights um, around the data that will uh, be relevant there and um, what is required from you. Otherwise, make sure that you have a data transfer or data sharing and data protection clause in your collaboration agreement. Our legal advisors will always include that in a collaboration agreement to make sure that, that we know exactly what is expected and where the data will be, uh, where it will be stored, how it will be shared, who's taking responsibility and uh, what the tools and platforms are that will be used to make sure that if you are going to collect personal information from um, data or uh, project uh, participants, then we must know exactly what will happen during and after the the project. So it, it all uh, comes down to the agreement, the funding agreement or the collaboration agreement. Um, I hope that answers your question, Dr. Melindy. Great, uh, thumbs up, that's what we want to see. Um, the second question is from um, Roger who says, if our research methods include using video, these files can get very large. Is there a limit on the amount of storage space we could use on Sun Scholar data or OneDrive? Um, Samuel and Hilda, I'm handing this one over to you. Um, I, I see that Hilda has um, answered that a bit in the um, the chat section, but I'll just add on to that. Um, so um, this as Hilda pointed out, the storage capacity on Microsoft OneDrive is five terabytes. Um, this is mainly during the active phase of research projects. Um, however, the storage capacity on Sun Scholar data is more restricted. So researchers generally start off with about 20 uh, gigabytes, but they can request more storage. But it should be noted that Sun Scholar data is only used to publish uh, research data which are not sensitive in nature. Um, I'm not sure if I actually specified that in my presentation. As such, if you have video files that contain sensitive data, you wouldn't actually want to publish that on Sun Scholar data. So you wouldn't actually um, probably try to even store it on the repository. However, what we can do is we can create a metadata record on Sun Scholar data, which could include information relating to the manner in which um, you as a researcher can be contacted so that people can actually gain access to the videos. So it would just be a metadata record and it would appear as if the research data are sort of like under embargo, but the data could be still hosted, um, I say on Microsoft OneDrive, but ideally not because it's not really meant for data archiving. And perhaps Hilda will want to touch on that. It's really meant to be used during the active phase of the research process. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add uh, to that point, Hilda. Hi Samuel, no, uh, a different thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, we make the distinction, kind of a rule of thumb, that OneDrive is for individual researchers um, managing their data, as you say, during the active phase of their research. But one, when a research group collaborates and they collaboratively want to author documents um, and share content, then we recommend that they rather use a Microsoft Teams site which is more geared towards uh, group uh, data or content management. And that comes with 
more storage space. I'm not going to say how much, but it's considerably more, but we learned the hard way we shouldn't advertise it too widely. But I just want to invite any research groups, if you want a quick overview of the tips and tricks we learned about how to manage your content in a team site, if you are, for example, collaborating with external um, research collaborators as well, you can reach out to us again via the service desk and we'll be happy to, to schedule a, a short tips and tricks question and answer session. Um, I just want to add another point though about um, making the metadata record ac accessible on Sun Scholar data. In addition to that, if you have any data documentation, let's say a readme file associated with your videos that describes how the videos were collected, um, processed, et cetera, um, and the data that they contain, that too can actually be published if it's not, because it wouldn't really be um, sensitive um, in nature. So this can be a bit of a description regarding the data files, even if the data files are not actually published on some scholar data. But if they're not extremely large in nature and they're not sensitive, then it would be possible to actually publish the video files um, on Sun Scholar data. Um, can, does, can you describe the specific nature of the files that you were actually inquiring about, um, Roger? Uh, yes, there, so there are video files um, of myself and expert um, embodiment practitioners um, doing some kind of embodied practice. Um, I wouldn't think that those would be sensitive and we would cover that in the um, in the informed consent agreement. All right, uh, yeah, if, a, if informed consent has actually been obtained, um, not only to collect but to also publish the video files, and they're not extremely large. I don't know how large you meant in this case. Do you have an idea? At least uh, probably over a terabyte, I imagine. Um, I don't really have an idea right now, but uh, more right. than 10 gigs. <laughs> All right, if it's about a terabyte, then that might just be, uh, it might be too large to actually be published um, on the repository um, due to capacity constraints of the entire repository um, as a whole, then I'd probably defer to the metadata record as well as the data documentation solution that um, I mentioned earlier on. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next question is, I'm unfamiliar with the peer review publication process. If we submit our paper for peer review, do we always submit the data along with it? In which case, I assume we would then need to proceed with the data transfer. Samuel, can you answer that one for us, please? I don't think that the peer review process will be a data transfer. Um, it, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. When it comes to publications, um, yeah, you definitely won't need a data transfer to to have your paper peer reviewed, but you definitely have to have some kind of um, data availability clause or statement in your publication of where the the readers or the audience can get the, the data after the, the paper has been published. But yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure about the peer review um, process. I, I'm, I would think that you definitely need to submit the data, the, the data that's relevant to the paper um, along with your, because that's that will be part of the peer review. I don't know if, if Hilda or Samuel has some ideas around this. I think this is one we should take to um, Cornelia's team, Sarita, because it's a really good question. I would also like to find out what the answer is. OK, great. I'm making a note of this. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I see I was on mute the whole time. I was wondering why. <laughs> All right, my apologies. <laughs> uh, all right, um, so I can actually answer this right here. Um, Essentially, the way that it works is if you have um, data that needs to be peer reviewed, because essentially when you submit your actual article, there are some um, 
publishers that demand that you also submit your um, your research data. So what we do is that if you actually have the data accessible and um, available on Sun Scholar data is the repository allows us to generate um, what's known as a private link. So this private link can then be shared with the peer reviewers and they can access the research data on the repository, even though the research data have not actually been published. So they can verify that the research data are actually indeed on a repository. And furthermore, you can also reserve a DOI for the research data, but the DOI would only become active once the research data have um, actually been published. So that's a good thing because some researchers, um, some funders demand I mean, some publishers demand that they see a DOI before proceeding to actually publish a journal article. Now, there are two scenarios that arise in this case. Firstly, there are some publishers that demand that they only view that the, um, the research data are in a repository and that they will be assigned a, uh, a DOI. And then there are those who demand that the data be published before the journal article is actually published. So it becomes a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. So what we've decided to do that over the years is that um, since our repository regulation states that the research data must be associated with some kind of um, scholarly output, such as a journal article, we do try to proceed by publishing the, uh, the research data just so that the DOI can be active and accessible by the publishers. And then once the journal article has actually been published, we then um, require that the researcher give us the DOI for the um, journal article in question so that we can actually add that to the metadata record, um, in this case, on Sun Scholar data. So that's something to keep in mind. If you are going that route, then you should actually undertake to um, submit that DOI once it's actually been published. And furthermore, there should at least be some kind of evidence that your journal article has actually been approved for publication because we don't want to just publish something and then find that um, a journal article was not accepted or we sort of like have to actually unpublish the, the research data um, in question. Um, I trust this actually answers the, the question um, in this case, but you don't necessarily have to go and transfer the file to the um, to the publishers. You just make it accessible by making use of a, a private link and the link itself decays um, after three years. The last thing I want to point out about this is that um, it's important for researchers to note that the private link should not actually be used as the link for the research data within some journal articles. This has happened before where a researcher simply submitted the private link and the publisher published the data set as supplementary data with the private link. That should actually be the DOI and not the private link. So just keep that in mind. Thanks, Samuel. We always learn something new from you. Thanks a lot for that. You're welcome. Um, let me just see if I don't, I'm not missing any questions. Um, how different is um, Stellenbosch University OneDrive from Microsoft OneDrive? Hilda? I can answer this one and um, part of the next one, Sarita. So the university has a institutional agreement with Microsoft. We pay a pretty penny and our researchers get more Microsoft services and resources than one would get if you were to sign up in your personal capacity for a free account. Um, what we call that is the Stellenbosch University Microsoft tenant. So. Um, it is those Microsoft services, and it can be, for example, cloud infrastructure in the sense of Teams and OneDrive, um, but there can also be other services like Power Apps, for example. So Stellenbosch University OneDrive just says that it is Microsoft OneDrive, um, but Stellenbosch University IT has some um, capacity to configure, for example, the security controls related to those Microsoft services. So in terms of a platform, it's exactly the same thing. Um, it's just the enhanced version that we get because Stellenbosch University pays for it.
And that's why when you go to portal.office.com, don't sign in with your personal Microsoft account, sign in with your Stellenbosch University credentials. That was probably not the best explanation ever, but I hope it made some sense. Yes, um, I'm fine. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. OK, um, the next question about something like the open science framework, I think it might be worth mentioning that the regulations say make use of institutional tools um, as much as possible. But if you have a really good motivation for using something outside of the institutional toolbox, let us know and we'll evaluate it on a case by case basis. Um, so there are tools like Qualtrics, for example, that we do not have an institutional license for, but Qualtrics has specific functionality that cannot be met by REDCap or Sun Surveys or um, Microsoft Forms, for example. And in that case, we said it's fine. Um, the faculty is welcome to use Qualtrics. Ideally, not for sensitive data, but then we go and look at the security controls in place on that platform um, where possible we do a vulnerability scan and then it's not a hard no. We, we don't say you may only use what's in the toolbox and nothing else because we're very much aware of the fact that we don't have all of the highly specialized tools that our researchers require. So then you can again log a request on the service. They say, I want to use this tool that's outside of the toolbox. The research data management advisory group will discuss it um, and then we'll let you know whether you are welcome to go ahead with a tool or whether we would like to see some additional security controls implemented before you use it or whether we would recommend that you only use it for maybe low and medium data but not high risk data. Um, so it's it's really very much a case by case decision um, and not a hard no. Um, Hilda, can I just add on um, to um, what you stated about um, sure. open science framework? Um, so it, the context really depends on um, the manner in which you actually want to use um, open science framework. So it can be used during the active phase and some would try to say use, they would use it during the passive phase, but it's not really a research data repository. So that being stated, I want to point out, out that um, open science framework is something that has been considered. Um, discussions took place about this um, a few years ago um, at, at the library. At that time, obviously, um, we we're setting up the data repository and that was a priority. And then beyond that, setting up something like a data management planning tool was a priority and it was prioritized over having something like open science framework when the university's IT division already had solutions in place for the active phase tools such as Microsoft OneDrive and Microsoft uh, Teams. Although there are certain things that open science framework does do that those tools do not. Um, one um, of the drawbacks um, with using, let's say, open science framework is the fact that you can sort of like publish uh, the data. So it then starts functioning like a data repository, um, but that means you can actually publish things even before they've actually been vetted through the Sun Scholar um, data system. Um, so that was a, a bit of an issue, but the main thing was that it would actually be looked at after um, the DMP solution had actually gone online. The other thing I want to point out is that these discussions took place before certain provisions of the papaya had actually been promulgated. And I think that happened maybe two years ago. And this is the reason why we recommend that researchers make use of institutional, institutionally recommended solutions. What the legislation states in um, one of the provisions is that you should try to, if you're actually hosting research data, especially where the research data in question are sensitive, you should have mechanisms in place to make sure that the data are, are actually secure. And what's explicitly mentioned is that you can do this by making use of things such as contracts. Now, if an individual makes use of open science framework individually, that means they, there won't be an institutional contract in place between open science framework and Stellenbosch University. And open science framework can actually be used um, individually. 
So the only way you can why, uh, find a way around this is if you actually have an institutional solution, such as has been um, suggested um, by Jeremiah. That's the only way to go around this. And I think VITS and UCT do have institutional um, versions of this. But insofar as it provides um, unlimited access, the problem is that the data are hosted in the United States. And if you're collecting sensitive data, the question is, did you actually obtain informed consent that it, and you, did you inform your research participants that the data would not be stored in South Africa? Because the papaya does actually have a provision dealing with cross-border transfers. And if your data will be transferred across South African borders, you actually need to inform your researchers about that beforehand. And this is, becomes a problem if you're using the cloud version of um, of um, open science um, framework in the absence of an um, uh, of an institutional um, license. So I think um, it's still something that can be up, um, put up for discussion. It might be redundant in, um, in the sense that it would uh, duplicate what uh, Microsoft Teams and Microsoft um, OneDrive um, already do. And then the question would be, why would you expend any funds to duplicate the process? But if there's an, any additional functionality, and there is, then that could justify um, such an expenditure. So it's something that um, I won't say it's in the pipeline, but it has certainly been considered, um, certainly has been considered. And I think that it's worth considering once again, especially once the DMP um, uh, solution actually goes online, because that is most certainly um, more of a priority, especially given some of the requirements coming from the papaya, which stipulate that, um, at least if you look at the papaya code of conduct that's being developed right now for the higher education and um, research sector, it states that DMPs must be used. So then it becomes more important for us to actually focus on that before we look at a solution such as open science framework, which is not necessarily um, mandated um, legislatively. Um, I hope that actually, I, I assume that actually answers the question. Yeah. Um, did that answer your question, Jeremiah? Yes, thanks, Sam. You're welcome. Okay, it seems that Hilda answered the last question of the OneDrive and Teams data storage platforms in South Africa. Um, so I don't see any other questions. Anybody else want to ask something? Sarita, if I may, um, I just want to invite our researchers who have nice, complex cloud-related um, requirements. At the moment, we are engaging with our cloud service providers to roll out or to pilot, rather, first new cloud-related uh, services, and we are looking for nice meaty use cases, people who want to use um, uh, cloud compute for very big data sets. So if that sounds like you and your research group, please, please reach out to us if you have time to participate in work sessions. Okay, 